Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. I have a beautiful soul on the air today. For those of you who are familiar with me, you know that my passion is saving marriages. Well, Bethany Miola is on the same playing field as I am. She and her husband, Dr. Dan uh, Miola, are the co-founders of Life Giving Wounds. Um, he is, I'm going to start with Daniel, even though he's not going to be with us today, but Daniel is an adult child of divorce. Um, and he earned his PhD in theology of marriage and family from the JP2 Institute. I don't want to make it sound like I'm taking that lightly. So I'll say the pontifical John Paul II Institute for studies on marriage and family in DC. So um, he's got that together. They run retreats. They work with adult children of divorce. Bethany is no slouch herself. She's got a master of theology studies from the same, from JP2. Um, and she and Dan met and married in 2011. I'm going to actually stop right there on the intro and let her take it um, from there. So Bethany, thank you so much for being on the air. That's I'm just always excited to talk about this type of a topic. Yeah, no, thank you. And I'm excited to chat. Uh, looking forward to getting into it. Oh, so let's just go right into it. So everyone who knows me knows that I save marriages for a living, not I, but God through me, right? And you guys are coming from that. Yeah, let's save them together because we've been there. So can you kind of tell us your story on the founding? And I already touched on the fact that Dan is an adult child of divorce. What are you, what about you? Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, we founded Life Human Wounds uh, several years ago. Um, started doing retreats in 2015 and then officially founded in 2018 and became a nonprofit in 2020. So we just celebrated our, our third anniversary as a nonprofit. So we're kind of a baby uh, organization, but, uh, you know, growing mightily and quickly. Um, so our, our background, our, our story, as you mentioned, my husband, Dan, is an adult child of divorce. Uh, his parents separated when he was 11 and they had a, a fairly long separation period. Um, they officially divorced when he was 26, um, which was the year that we got married. There was kind of a, um, a profound, uh, sad irony in, th in that, in that uh, circumstance. Um, his dad is remarried um, outside of the church and his mom is what we, we uh, know and love as standards, um, is faithful to her marriage vows. That's an incredible witness to, to us. Um, for myself, my parents are, are still married, thanks be to God, uh, but did go through a, a lot of ups and downs when I was growing up. They separated physically two times, um, but have persevered and reconciled. So kind of their own really important witness. So that's kind of our backgrounds. Um, when we met, we were at the John Paul II Institute, uh, as you mentioned. So we were just being completely steeped in the church's beautiful vision of marriage and family. Um, it's beautiful, uh, you know, teaching on indissolubility, you know, all the all the wonderful things, um, especially that St. John Paul II has given the church and the theology of the body. Um, and at the time, the Institute was really looking at this question of the effects of divorce on children. So Dan in particular was really blessed to kind of partner with the Institute in this the research project that they were working on. And it was really from that place Plus his own background in particular um, that sparked this desire that we um, consider from the Holy Spirit to found life giving wounds. Um, we really saw that, you know, for adult children of divorce, there wasn't anything uh, kind of systematically being done in the church um, to tend to those wounds. So, of course, you know, Dan in particular and myself have been really blessed with amazing holy priests and mentors. Um, but a lot of that we had to seek out ourselves. You know, I know Dan really had to seek that out, find those people in his life. Uh, so we really felt on our hearts that we wanted to contribute to a culture where children of divorce have a place to go in the church where they are not only understood and heard on a deep level, uh, but also guided and accompanied in that path of healing um, that the Lord wants from us. So that's uh, that's why we started Life Giving Wounds. And um, it's just been a, a joy to see where the Lord has has taken the ministry so far. Yeah, I can't wait to. So you've been on my show before, and I just can't wait to tell my listeners more about it, um, because there is such a desperate need for it, as you've mentioned, alluded to, and my viewers know I hold standers meetings. Standers are people who are standing for marital reconciliation while their spouse is cheating on them or divorcing them or has divorced them or has a child with the other person. And this person is standing on the vows they made at the altar, which is the most heavy. It's a heavy, one of the heaviest crosses you could ever carry. And I say that Bethany, because I used to say it's the heaviest cross you can carry apart from the death of a child. Of course, you know, there are other heavy crosses like being sex trafficked or something like that. But 
I have two standers in my group and we have over 300 people now from 40 states and 10 countries that are standing and two of them have lost children. And they said that standing is harder than the death of their child because it is a daily rejection. Oh, move on. You're deluded. Get, you know, and and so I would guess as adult children of well, and I too am an adult child of divorce, but it's very similar because there's this assumption that you well, not in your case, praise God, your parents are, are reconciled, but in Dan's case, move on, dude. You know, get over it. You, their parents are happy. You deserve to be happy. You know, go go in and give them some grace, and it just disavows his wounds and so that alone is heavy because you feel as if you need to carry that cross by yourself you know so it yeah is that, a heavy cross. that's you so cross. true I mean a kind of a, a place that we start with life giving wounds is talking about the wound of silence which is a, precisely what you're what you're alluding to um that sense that a lot of adult children of divorce feel like it's not okay to talk about their pain um Elizabeth Marquard came up with the the perfect phrase divorce happy talk um, so anytime, you know, divorce is talked about, you got to look at the benefits and who, you know, that this is all for the best and, and all these messages that especially the children of divorce can get. Um, and we see, see people at every one of our retreats who have a, a just a profound sense of uh, relief at being at a place where they can talk about the ways that their parents' divorce has impacted them um, and that it wasn't all pleasant, you know, and even when, even when positive benefits come from it, um, even when, you know, fighting or abuse, you know, is diminished, um, even then there are still wounds. It's not like that makes all the pain of um, losing your parents' love together go away. Um, so that's often a place we start just encouraging people to feel, feel okay and being able to talk about it um, and knowing that we can say these things, we can say the ways it's affected them, affected ourselves. That doesn't mean that we don't love our parents. That doesn't mean that we don't respect and honor our parents, that there's a way to, to proceed with our own stories um, and, and seek that healing. It's such an important first step of healing. Yeah. Well, you know, um, what you just said, it's funny because I'm like so intent on listening. And then all of a sudden the thoughts will leave your head and you're like, oh, um, so now I just forgot what I was going to say, but I'm sure it was brilliant. Oh, what were I'm you sure. saying? Yeah, it, it was. I'll come back to it. Oh, well, I think it had to do with the children of, you no, know, left again. Um, <laughs> it'll come back to me. It'll come back to me. Let me, I do want to touch on something that you said because you're forced, this is what's the irony. You're forced to be gentle with the people who are divorced. And, oh, I know what I was going to say. Remind me if I forget it. It is about the abuse. Um, for instance, when you said Dan's parents are married outside the church, we need to take back the language because the pain that comes from saying, well, they're not married. It's a legalized state of adultery. And people don't want to hear you say that. And they're like, you know, go get an annulment as if it's just a paperwork thing, which of course the scandal in the church, we get it. That has caused that. But the annulment process is checking to see, was there a marriage ever there before? So saying someone's married outside the church is like saying it is the truth is that no, Dan's father is married to Dan's mother. And now he's living in an adulterous union. See, I'm not even allowed to say that mm -hmm. because half the people watching are like, oh, another tough thing, which is what I forgot was I'm so glad you, you mentioned children who had to witness abuse. I get so much pushback there. Because I'm like, absolutely, if there's abuse in the house, get out and get safe. They think that I'm saying stay and get abused. It's more important than breaking the marriage. But you are so right, because even a child who witnessed abuse, they don't want to witness the abuse anymore. But they also don't say, OK, now that they're apart, I'm super happy. It's why can't you learn to be kind to each other and to not abuse each other? And then to come back, you know what I mean? Right, so that's yeah. a long soliloquy on my part. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we had this, this experience earlier this year where we put something up on Instagram, a reel um, that really just what we shared, what we thought was a fairly straightforward message that divorce harms children, you know, and those, those wounds can last for a long time. Um, somehow the reel got picked up by quite a, quite a, seen by quite a number of people and the consistent message coming back, the pushback was, you know, what about abuse? What about toxic relationships? So we just felt like 
like it was a moment that we could really engage um, and clarify because I think there could be a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, the church is certainly not saying that people should stay in abusive, dangerous situations, uh, you know, which I feel like we can't say enough <laughs> because you do have a, a misunderstanding. The church can be both against divorce. Divorce is not what God intends for any marriage, but also against people being harmed in their marriages. The catechism Absolutely. and canon law are very clear on that. Um, and I think where we come from as a ministry uh, trying to help people find healing is honoring the many wounds that can come within families. Um, it doesn't have to be one or the other. And we do, we, we have seen many people who come to us who feel a sense of like, finally, someone gets it. Like, yeah, I really hated growing up in an environment where my parents were not good with each other. You know, I didn't like to see that, but I'm also really sad that they couldn't figure out how to make it work. You know, I have both of these sadnesses. It's not that one, is, you know, has to cancel out yeah. the other. So just speaking to, speaking to all of it, <laughs> there's a lot of pain out there. Um, and very much what we're trying to do is share that, that love of Jesus, who's right there in the pain, whatever people have experienced um, and seeing some beautiful, beautiful healing uh, come in the midst of some pretty horrific situations. Yeah. So let's go there. So I'm excited. So I kind of came with the harsh stuff and the, you know, keep fighting, but you really are bringing and changing lives. So can you tell us a little bit about what's happening at Life Giving Wounds? So I know overview you just gave us, but can I take us deeper? What does it look like for someone who comes to your organization, attends a retreat, uh, aftercare, just take us on that journey? Sure, definitely. Um, so our mission is to give voice to the pain of adult children of divorce and to help them find deep transformative healing in Christ. Um, so everything we do flows from that mission. Um, kind of the capstone heart of what we're offering is a weekend retreat. Uh, we're offering them around the country. By the end of the year, we'll have offered over 20 retreats throughout the country and in Canada. We'll be in Canada in September. <laughs> so first international retreat. Um, and the folks that come to us, it's anyone who is 18 up whose parents are no longer together. So that is whether their parents were married, then divorced. It's whether their parents received a declaration of nullity or not. Maybe their parents weren't even married and later split up. It's everything. So that common commonality, common central experience of losing the love of their parents together, um, of losing that unity. Um, gosh, I could, <laughs> we could talk the entire time of the beautiful fruits of healing that have come from well, what me, we're seeing. Give me some. Sure. Just, yeah. Okay. That's so, always the cool um, part. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I would say for, uh, for us, one thing that we just love seeing is people who come to the retreat and it's not just the retreat. It's so much that the Lord's already doing in their hearts. Um, but have a sense that they now feel so much more confident in their own relationships, um, you know, which really connects to what you're doing with saving marriages. Because um, as we know, children of divorce are statistically more at risk for divorce themselves. So we're really trying to get at the at the heart of that to help the children of divorce, you know, be able to marry successfully, which is so much the part on the heart of so many, um, so many children of divorce. So hearing from people that that let us know, like, oh, like I. I just like when I went on retreat, I just I felt so much more ready to get engaged or to get married or I'm seeing these fruits in my marriage. Um, we we often have couples who come together that are, are that are both the children of divorce, come on the retreat together, talk about ways that even, you know, decades into their marriage, they're finding new ways to grow with each other by looking at these wounds and sharing in that together. Um, we also have priests, religious, uh, those in consecrated life who come. Um, it's beautiful to hear how the retreat impacts them too. Often there can be kind of an extra level of feeling alone if you're in a consecrated in the consecrated life or you're in a position of leadership. Um, there can be a sense that, you know, we can look at those people with very rose colored glasses, like, oh, I'm sure they come from this great Catholic family. You know, I'm sure like how can they possibly have gone through these experiences that I have? Um, and so for them, being able to talk about it, even with other priests or other religious and feeling re reconvicted about their own vocations, um, for the priests to be able to be spiritual fathers, and maybe these are men who never had a, um, a good example of an earthly father, but finding that, being able to do that in a new way. Um, the religious sisters being able to love in a new way. Thanks for he like from healing their wounds. Um, it's, it's beautiful to, to see and to think about the ripple effects uh, that, you know, one person finding healing, finding deep healing in the Lord and the ways that that affects everyone in their life. Um, we, we love to see it. <laughs> so it's, yeah. a, it's a joy. That's There's so many blessings that come from just talking about these things and taking them to Jesus and seeing the ways that the Lord is calling us to grow, but doing so with just such love and tenderness. Yeah, I am excited about the priests because one of the 
one of the uh, future aspects of my mission, my, we've applied for 501c3 status. So we also plan to have retreats, but we have a group of people who need spiritual direction. And of course, you know, me and my team provide that now, but we want a priest. And what I've found is so many priests are adult children of divorce or um, they've been trained in the church. And, and I see this way too often. Uh, a couple has been in priest, you know, fa Father Bob, Father Bob's parish. Mr. and Mrs. Smith have been their parishioners. Um, Mr. Smith leaves Mrs. Smith. And then Father Bob tells Mr. Smith, it's okay, you'll probably get an annulment. And then Father Bob tells Mrs. Smith, it's okay. Jesus loves you. Go on. You'll probably get an annulment. It'll be okay. And so we find that, and the priest means well, Father Bob means well, right? He's thinking your pain will go away, Mrs. Smith, if you just get this annulment. See, the church has got gotcha. you. And they don't realize. And again, it's not any negative intentions. It's, it's lack of understanding or of, of this group of people. And so the idea that you're training our priests so that our priests can go look at Mr. and Mrs. Smith and say, no, Mr. Smith, you can work this out with Mrs. Smith. Um, you need to leave your mistress because you will hurt your children if you don't. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that definitely. makes me quite happy. Ha have you seen anything kind of um, with the priests saying, I feel better equipped to save marriages or what are you getting feedback in that area? Yeah, we, so we ran our first seminary group this year, um, out at Kenrick Glennon Sem Seminary in St. Louis. Uh, there was 18 seminarians who went through the retreat material as a small group, um, which is the first time we've been in a seminary, you know, as opposed to priests or religious joining us just on the regular retreats. Um, and it was definitely beautiful to hear their feedback afterwards. Now, these were all, they were all priests who were adult children of divorce themselves. So it was for them personally, but for them in a way that now they're just so much more equipped to help the many people in their future flocks um, who, who come from that background. Um, I think that's something that uh, we're definitely seeing that priests appreciate kind of knowing like, what do, what do I say, you know, to the young man or young woman who comes to me and brings up this wound? Um, or what do, you know, what do I say on Father's Day, uh, knowing that there's so many people in my congregation who did not have that great example of a father? Or, I mean, the similar would be for Mother's Day, like the woundedness of the, of the congregation. Um, so we're definitely seeing some really beautiful examples of that spiritual fatherhood to be attentive to those wounds. Um, and as to what you're saying, just be more aware that you know, we need to help marriages that are in trouble, if at all possible for them to, to make it and to be reconciled, because the negative ripple effects, effects of that, um, of those marriages breaking apart is just so serious. Um, so certainly a lot, that's a big joy of ours is sharing about this with priests and church leaders. Um, and so many of them are truly in tune uh, with what, what we find, but sometimes just not quite sure, like, okay, but now what, like, how do I tackle this? Um, or how do I talk about it? And um, it's beautiful to to kind of see that that growing awareness and openness um, to kind of enter into these difficult places. Is it fair to say that you guys simply give them the confidence they need to go? No, no, no. This is real. You're not alone. All these people feel this way. Now, now you can address it safely. Is, I think so. What? Yeah, I think I think definitely. And and finding some language. I mean, you know, throughout our retreat, um, you know, the just the kind of putting words to things. I think really helps. Um, you know, finding ways to say that what is the wound of silence? Like there can be a lot, just that light bulb of awareness that can go on in people's eyes um, when they hear that or talking about the wound to identity and going deep into that, like, oh my gosh, yes. Like that describes what I've experienced. Um, I, I mean, I think naming something is so helpful to be able to heal it. Um, so that's a lot of what we're doing too, because sometimes, you know, people may not, they feel that sense of discomfort or angst or sadness, but are not quite sure how to, how to put it into words. Um, so I think that's a lot of what we're doing, just bringing that into the light um, that then the Lord can enter and be like, ah, oh, yes, like these are the places where I need this healing and you can see it more clearly and then see that progress and growth in those areas. So half of America, so half of my viewers, which actually is around the world, um, are, are divorced. So I don't want to steal from what your ministry does, but I'd like you to kind of give us a quick lesson. So can you talk about the wound of silence to my viewers? <clears throat> because many of them are probably like, go there. What, what, what do you mean? Because I think I might have that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so wound of silence. Um, 
it could be an external uh, in, uh, imposition or it could be something internal. We kind of talk about it in both ways. So externally, I had mentioned the divorce happy talk. You know, if a child grows up and all they hear about the divorce is like, oh, but this made mom and dad so much happier. You know, you get two Christmases, uh, you have two houses, you have two of everything, you know, like you said in a very like, like everything. <laughs> but said in such a positive way. I mean, that's like an inter- external imposition of then like, like the child would not kind of feel comfortable sharing like I actually didn't want that like I don't want double the presents like I want my family together (laughs) at the holidays um so that's you know one way to look at it that wound of silence or just the general uh general you know if there's area areas we see that more support is given for the divorced parents than for the children uh that can just make it feel like I don't know like is there something for me can I talk about this um but also also there's an inch there could be an internal wound of silence we find a lot of children of divorce have a sense of false guilt or false shame about the divorce, um, which we know, like you read the psychological professionals, obviously, <laughs> when they're telling divorcing parents, make sure you tell the child it's not their fault. Even when the parents do that, there can be such a sense of like, well, was it about me? Like, was I not worth it? Uh, was I not a good enough kid to you know, did I cause problems? I mean, that could be like a sense of a very um, powerful sense of false guilt or false shame that can be really hard to heal through um, and make it feel like, I don't know if I even have a place to say this. So there's just so many complicated things that are going on um, and feeling that just that sen- that deep sense of, I'm not sure if this is okay to talk about. I'm not sure how it's going to be received. Um, and then on the flip side, finding those people who truly can receive that wound and do it in uh, do it in a way that it's not just like a big old vent session. Let's just talk about everything bad that's going on very in our important. lives. Um, but very much like it's okay to talk about it and we're going to move forward with the Lord together. We're not going to sugarcoat it, but we also, we don't want to stay there. Um, but it's a, it's a first step. It's so important. So that's a, uh, just a very brief summary of what we consider the wound of silence. That is so huge too. Just talking about venting Bethany. So what you just mentioned is something we do in my standards group and they do in Alcoholics Anonymous and they do in any of those anonymous meetings is that for instance, when you and Dan have fights, although I'm sure you never have fights, oh, right? <laughs> <laughs> but when you have fights never. or arguments, it is not really proper to tell your best friend, you know, Dan's such a jerk. He did this, he did that. And I'm really just mad at him because there's this husband's and wife's responsibility to cover each other's guilt and shame. And, and yet you need to process it. So how do you do that? How do you navigate that? So I always talk with my cl- couples, clients, whatever, or my individuals, standers, what is the difference between gossip and venting? And so in my standers group, I will say to them, this is where you vent. I'm so mad at my husband. He took my child on a date with the other woman or blah, 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 blah. But then when they're outside of our group, they only share, you know, Hey, what's going on with you and your husband? Just, just pray for us. I'm, we're, we're struggling. So the idea that you create this, this forum and you allow them to vent, but then also saying again, like there's a commandment, this honor thy father and thy mother. So how do you continue to honor them while expressing yourself? So that's why I want to stress with anybody watching the importance of signing up for life giving wounds. Um, if you're an adult child of divorce, because it's a safe space to vent. And I know you guys well enough to go that you're not going, yeah, let's just tear them down, right? It's letting them say it, letting them cry, directing their pain and kind of taking it, you know, into the healing place. Is that, is, yeah. would you like yeah, to restate yeah, that in a fair No, absolutely. I mean, the way that we look at our retreats, we model them after the Paschal Mystery. Um, So the first part of the retreat is the really tough stuff. You know, it's the dying. It's kind of going into like looking at all the ways, how, what are all the ways that my parents' divorce has affected me and really going there. And it's not easy. Um, It takes a lot of courage to go into those places. You know, we try, try to help people see like, are you ready for this? Um, you know, do you feel like you're emotionally ready and and give a lots of outs too? you know, if you get to a point where like, this is just too much, you know, take a break. Um, but we don't, we don't stop there. So then just like the Paschal mystery, you know, Jesus entered the tomb on the third day, he rose again, there is joy. There's the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and it's not minimizing anything that came before, you know, like Jesus really died. That was a really real grief. The stuff we're talking about is really real suffering and grief. 
but seeing that the Lord can still transform that. And then through that sense of resurrection, that sense of finding where the Lord is in all this mess, then kind of the third movement is the mission of going forth. Um, so finding even within our wounds, what is the Lord calling us to from these places that we've been hurt? Um, a, a lot of times, uh, you know, we have over 160 volunteers throughout the country who contribute in some way to life giving wounds. They're all alumni. Um, and all of them, one way that they see their their wounds becoming life giving is that they can help others who have experienced that same pain. Um, or some people might find like, oh, I you know, if I'm married, I really see that the way that my wound can become life giving is to be the best spouse I can possibly be, um, be completely intentional about my marriage, you know, pour myself into it in a way that I didn't see growing up. But now I'm going to be able to give this witness to the world and to my children. Um, so I, I I think I mean I I feel personally, and then also seeing the people that we minister to, being able to see that our wounds are not just something that we have to, you know, put up with or take passively, but that can constantly be watch bleed. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's so much, I mean, that's really where some of the joy can come from. And it's not that it's not going to hurt anymore, but being able to see like, this is not wasted. I'm not going to waste my suffering. I mean, that's what our Christian faith gives us in the teaching on redemptive suffering. Um, and I don't, yeah, <laughs> I don't see how you can cope with stuff like this without having something like that, having, having Jesus right there at the heart of it to bring some meaning into what we're going through. Who's your favorite story? You have to have like a person who you're like, oh, every time I think about the success of God through life giving wounds, that this person just touched me. Oh my gosh. You can use fake I, yeah. names, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I don't gosh. I don't know if I could pinpoint one favorite one. Um, I'll just say, and this is something of an amalgamation, but it really has been very eye-opening just to see the the depth of ugliness that can happen in the world um, to hear kind of the layers of abuse and neglect and just really, you know, parents just really not caring for their children and then hearing from those adult children, you know, years later as they're kind of processing through that. But then, you know, you hear those stories on retreat, but if you saw that person in a different context, you wouldn't know anything yeah, yeah. about it. I mean, and, and and all that is to say, like, just the depth of healing that can truly, truly happen. That then when you hear the story, you hear about, you know, the promiscuity, the abandonment, the, the person who went through several abortions because they're just looking for that love with someone, um, all of that. And you look at that person, you're like, oh, my gosh, like, this is a beautiful person and this is amazing <laughs> because you know a lot of you know, there are people who are are blessed to ha not have to go through any of that but then when you encounter those people who do and are still able by the grace of god to live this beautiful upstanding life i mean i i can barely think of any more powerful witness um to the redemptive power of our faith and the lord's healing so that's a little bit more of an amalgamation but we've encountered that just again and again um and it's a it's a profound privilege to have a small part to play on those people's journey um yeah <laughs> it's a lot i'm just i'm thinking of particular faces in my mind mm -hmm. um as i talk about it but it just it gives us that much more motivation like there are so many people out there who have those stories um who could really use that person to look at them with love um, and to receive their stories and to help them just take those steps forward, um, which is all about what we're trying to do every day. So um, you talked earlier about the priests having their sermons on Father's Day. What would you say, either you've kind of, I can't want to say you told them, but what kind of direction do you go and I guess, what do those sermons end up being is, is what I'm getting at. How do they take what you guys have gotten and how do they address Father's Day, i.e. then how do you address Father's yeah, Day? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so my dream sermon <laughs> would be, number one, acknowledging that, you know, this can be a day of a lot of mixed emotions for people. That simple acknowledgement uh, and not assuming that for everyone, they have a living father who's a beautiful example of what it means to be a father. Acknowledging it, you know, not all of us have received that example of fatherhood. Um, then second, reminding all of us that fathers are meant to image the love of God, the father, but they're not the source of that love. And even when we do not have a father that has been that caring, attentive source of guidance, we always have that in God the Father. That's the source. That's what we go back to. Um, I think anything along those lines, I 
I personally, I would really love to hear more sermons like that um, because it's, it's true. Like those it, praise God for the fathers that do image God, the father's love. Um, obviously every, all humans are, are sinners, but we, I mean, we're blessed with many good examples of fathers and fatherhood. Um, but even for those who aren't, that doesn't leave them, them orphans. You know, we have God, the father, we have examples of good priests. We have examples of the saints of St. Joseph. Um, so just turning, turning our hearts back to the true depth of what fatherhood is meant to image. Um, and the same would go for motherhood too. You know, the example read of my mind. Mother. Yeah, <laughs> um, the church is our loving mother. I mean, all the all the ways that that can actually be lived out and help to heal those wounds from from mothers too. Um, which I I wonder it's like sometimes that's even more tricky because you do have just kind of an angelic view of mothers, um, and then those who we know plenty of people in our ministry that their moms have not been the moms that they desired or needed and you know where to go where to go with that especially around mother's day when it can end up being just very sugar-coated and you know you look at the card aisle like it's hard to find a card for the complicated relationship that i have with my mom um so yeah we do a lot you know around those days especially through our social media outreach just to kind of put voice to some of those feelings uh in in the in the, the hope that people just won't feel so alone on those holidays in particular do you find that the wound, okay, it's different, of course, but maybe not actually, from when it was your dad who was the abandoner or the mom, I think of a young man I've worked with and he was ab abandoned by his mom. She left at the age of 10 and, and, and he never saw her again until 21. And and he said, now I, I get it. My dad was abusive. I saw that. That wasn't good either. I get why my mom left, but she left me. She left the mm -hmm. kids. Um, so do you find there's an especially deep wound in one direction or the other, or really life-giving wounds kind of helps us see how a wound is a wound and they all have to kind of go towards the same salve? I mean, it's so personalized, you know, what, what, depending on what a person has been through. Um, I'd say we definitely hear like, you know, if there's a woman, especially whose mom has not been a great example, it can definitely make it more difficult to just figure out like, what am I called to be as a woman? You know, if that, if she ends up getting married and having children, it can be like, there's not a great example to follow. Um, kind of similar for, for fathers. I mean, I know the research, like fathers are the ones who are le less, much less likely to be the custodial parent, far more likely to have a tenuous relationship with, with the child. Um, and they've showed some like, you know, very direct effects of lack of fatherhood, um, possibly because it is, it's more common. Um, but I think, yeah, what what we're trying to do is just help people see no matter what your circumstance has been, kind of go to the heart of that, um, engage with it, see where the Lord is in it, um, and to find other people who are able to talk about it with you. I mean, it's just really refreshing and a relief to find someone like, oh, yeah, I really had this really difficult experience with my mom. Like, oh, you did, too. Like, let's let's share. Let's share stories and find that commonality um, is a great comfort also. Do Protestants attend your retreats and use your um, services or is this, I know it's designed by Catholics for Catholics, but. Yeah, I would say more it's designed as a wholeheartedly Catholic approach to family wounds. Um, but we're, we, uh, we have right on our FAQs, we're more than willing, any person of any religious persuasion is welcome to come, um, knowing that it is a Catholic retreat. So that's where all of our teaching is grounded in. That's the truths that are going to be shared. Um, the devotions, the practices, adoration is a, a pivotal point on the retreat. Um, for non-Catholics, we always give them the option if there's a particular prayer practice that you'd like to opt out of and journal or private prayer or so forth, feel free. Um, but yeah, we've gotten really good feedback from Protestants, from non-Christians, uh, from folks that are not really one thing or another in terms of their religious life right now. Um, we're, we're definitely seeing the evangelizing potential of what we're doing, uh, that it's attra it attracts people who are not necessarily really connected with their Catholic faith or with any faith, but are looking for this help and healing uh, and weren't quite sure where to find it. So we've had, we had a Buddhist attend our retreat and really like it. <laughs> so it's certainly not just Catholics. It's mostly Catholics, but not all. So can you, I know I focused a lot on the retreats, but you said you're not just retreats. You have an online presence. So if someone, so first of all, we want to send people to lifegivingwounds.com. Org? Dot org. Yes. Yeah. Dot org. Is there a hyphen in the life giving or is it one word? Uh, nope. It's just all one word. 
So yeah. lifegivingwounds.org. They go there very specifically, like, what do they have? You have like a thread where they can post, you have phone calls with personal people, you have the retreat. What do we have? Yeah, so I have a visitor to our website um, can see very easily our calendar. So all the upcoming retreats, I think between now and the end of 2023, we have 10 retreats coming up, um, including one online that anybody could participate from anywhere, of course. Um, on our website, too, we have a whole library of resources. So we have recommended books, the books that are like really good on this topic, um, recommended articles, blogs, and even just going through those resources, I think could be a real source of illumination for, for folks. Um, and then we also have our own uh, generated blog, meaning we have a team of over 40 writers who contribute their stories and their insights to our blog. Um, so those two places are what we always recommend if someone is just kind of putting their toe in the water, kind of wanting to look at this issue, not quite sure if they're ready for, you know, a whole weekend retreat or doing something with others. Um, we're trying to make our website a place that someone can come for comfort and guidance, um, no matter where they are on their particular healing journey. So then what? So they've gotten uh, this online presence. Do they ever get one-on-one -on -one contact with a voice apart from at a retreat? Yeah. Um. So our, our particular events are the places where we are encountering uh, the folks that are joining us for our retreats. We have a couple support groups that we do. Um, really, we're looking to set up local chapters throughout the country. So that's our model. So when we go in and run a retreat, it's not meant to be just a one-off. Um, we're working with the local diocese or campus ministry or a particularly vibrant parish to train up people who can continue on with the ministry. Because um, we absolutely know that having that in-person connection is just so crucial and having people locally to turn to. Uh, so by the end of this year, we'll have established 18 chapters throughout the country uh, that we from the national level will give the support to to continue on um, and be a source of support for the adult children of divorce in the area. I'm just curious, um, have you found that uh, any parent who finds out that their child is you know, a part of this group or attended a retreat, have you ever heard any feedback that that adult child of divorce received an apology from mom or dad or really, or even said, you know what, I'm going to try to reconcile with dad or mom. I mean, that would be huge because of yeah, these pains I, mean, I never knew. We yeah, it. no, we do. I mean, I, we were just talking with someone who um, just ended up having a heart to heart with a parent that they had never had before. Uh, I can't, I mean, we, we can't really take credit for that. It came more from the parent side, but then our former participant was telling us he just felt in like the right place to engage in that type of conversation after having gone through the life giving wounds retreat and being connected with other people in that realm. Um, yeah, it's a topic that comes up a lot. I mean, we've done support group sessions on it. Like, you know, what do you do? How do you relate to your parents? What if they never apologize? What if they do? And I mean, we always, one thing that we emphasize is not to, um, not to expect it or to think that your healing is dependent on what your parent or parents might choose to do. Um, we know that for a lot of people, it may never happen. Like the apology may never come. Even the acknowledgement that anything wrong was done may never happen. Um, so a lot of what we try to talk about is like, what do you do in those cases? Like you desire this apology, desire this deep reconciliation, but it's it's not up to you, you know? And so we can do, we like we can work on our own healing. We can offer forgiveness um, that might be offered unilaterally. You know, there may be no acceptance of, of anything wrong done. Uh, but of course, it's a great gift when when that is or when a parent has a conversion, a change of heart, is able to see in a new way and able to apologize. I mean, that's tremendous. Um, I'd say it seems to be the minority, but it's definitely a gift uh, when that can happen. Wow. Well, we as adult children of divorce, we need to create a safe space because we forget that our parents are human, too. Mm -hmm. We need to not attack and we need to be able to say it's OK you know, I understand why you did this. I understand you made this, you know, mistake. Um, it's, it's kind of saying it's okay if you say sorry, because I'm not going to attack you because I've made my own mistakes. You know what I mean? The symbiotic kind of, maybe you're as a child, not that you're an adult, the one that can make it safe for your mom to say, I, I or your dad, I'm so sorry. I wish I could do things differently, you know? Yeah, no, that's possible. I mean, I know I can be hopeful to understand that, you know, parents too may have gone through really traumatic things. You know, these, these choices, like 
marriage is falling apart. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. Like very often the parents themselves didn't get a good example of marriage or had their own wounds that may have never been dealt with. Uh, that, can, that doesn't excuse choices. You know, we're still responsible for our own actions, but it can help, you know, grow that level of empathy um, just for our own peace of mind. And I know like one thing that one of our participants said that has always stuck with me is learning to accept the love that your parent can give you. It might not be what you deeply, you most deeply desire, um, but there still could be something there. And that's hard. That's not an instant thing to be okay with. Like, oh, like I wish I had a parent who could do this or offer me this. I have a parent that can do a little bit, you know, and I'm going to choose to accept it. And there still might be some grieving of not having a fully present, capable parent, but having, having what is being offered, um, which I think is kind of a good example of kind of that place of both grieving, but also not being completely stuck or victimized in that, in that place, but choosing to just relate to the people in our lives in a way that's going to be more peaceful and joyful, open-hearted um, in the midst of, of that suffering. Uh, I tell that to my married couples. I'm like, you know what, try, I don't want you to set your standards low, but you are married. And so now just try to be content with what your spouse is capable of giving, uh, you know, assuming they're actively trying to give all that can, you know, mm -hmm. instead of having these romanticized or idealized um, images of what our marriages should be, you know, and yeah. that helped mine when I realized my husband would never be a good communicator. That's me. I've got the communication degrees, right. But he can sure fix a house, you know, so <laughs> we had to, when we under, yeah, when we cut another human being mental slack, we do a lot, not just for them, but for ourselves. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So tell my viewers again, how they can find you, um, anything. Now we always want to help. I, I always want to get like, a if you, any ways that they can help you donate money to the industry, your organization so that they can, um, help other adult children of divorce. Uh, how can we find you? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, easiest place is our website, lifegivingwounds.org. Uh, we're also on Instagram and Facebook if folks are there and want to connect with us. Um, and for sure, we're always uh, really grateful for all the donations. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, independent, national apostolate. <laughs> so uh, we're not funded by any big parent organization. This is all grassroots from the ground up. Um, as I said, we're newer, we're only about three years old officially, uh, but we're growing, you know, our, our chapters are growing, our, our reach is growing. It's, it's an exciting place to be. Um, and donations can be made right through our website. There's a very clear give page. Um, we have a great promo video. If you want to kind of take a look at, you know, what are people actually saying and what is, what, what does the ministry look like and hear from participants in their own words of how it's affected them. Um, and yeah, please pray for us. <laughs> Do you uh, speak at the, Catholic churches? The... I mean, so if someone wants to get a chapter in their church or in their state, um, can they bring you in as speakers? Is that something? Yeah, definitely. You yeah. Um, both myself and my husband. Um, I think Dan has probably done more talks than I have, but we both do speaking, uh, for different groups. So absolutely. And it's a range of, we're speaking to a, you know, speak to a more general audience or specifically to an audience, uh, more like of adult children of divorce and lots of things in between. Um, so for sure, that's very much part of our mission, giving voice to the pain and then giving, uh, helping uh, find healing through those wounds. Second, last question. How has life giving wounds helped your own marriage between you and Dan having gone through what you did? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> well, it definitely has grown us and stretched us to uh, found our own business in effect. <laughs> um, so uh, doing that, doing that together, well, we, I mean, we get to do it together. You know, he, we were working on this together. Um, it's very much from our own marriage, especially, I'd say, especially giving the talks and helping with retreats. And for me, being able to see all the ways that, that, that the Lord is using Dan to bless people, um, to help them heal. I just love that. I love getting to see that part of him. Um, and yeah, I mean, we very much see it as a mission from the heart of our, of our marriage, um, for sure. So that's a real joy to, to get to do that together along with all the, all the challenges that I'm sure any, any couple that's, uh, in, in business or running a, a ministry together. Um, definitely the Lord is calling us to, you know, deeper growth through all of that too. Wow. Well, I'm really excited because I know I, I well, I've had you here before. So I know just how much blood and sweat and tears and 
time and talent you guys have had to put into this. So I'm, I'm going to be connecting you to my standards because we've got, you know, thousands of kids in our, my own group that have been affected by divorce. So yeah, no, um, that would, be great. would, would great. love to connect you guys with them. So second, uh, the final question, name one thing you would have our listeners do differently as a result of something they heard today, give them some actionable step. One thing to do differently. <clears throat> I, gosh, the thing that's on my heart the most, I would say if all of your listeners could go to adoration and pray there, uh, I guess I, I'm just feeling, I'm feeling the movement of the whole Eucharistic revival and just wanting that to be more present. Um, and if they wouldn't mind saying a prayer for life giving wounds and in particular, all adult children of divorce and all standards, um, just taking them before the Eucharistic Lord um, and and praying for for all all of their needs. That would be my one request. I think that's something most of us can do. <laughs> so I would take it. Um, and if you want to share the show with an adult child of divorce or someone who's considering divorce, because often if they see that th their decision to divorce is going to cause a lifetime of pain to their children. It has caused, I know my good friend Layla Miller has said it has caused people to stop, turn around and work again at their marriage. She's the author of Primal Loss, the now adult children of divorce speak. And I think you guys are familiar with Layla as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah good, good friend. friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love Layla Miller. But um, go and in, send this video to anyone you think it could help because often you don't have the words, but Bethany has the words, Dan has the words, the Holy Spirit has the words, and he uses them as instruments. Maybe your kids or your nieces and nephews or your siblings need to attend this retreat. Or So just get the word out. If when you face God and he says to you, well, why didn't you, why didn't you at least let that person know that this existed? Because we're going to have to make an account of everything. And sometimes some of you are like, I can't do anything. Actually just sharing a show like this because sometimes, I'll tell you, Bethany, you know this to be true. People are like, I don't want people to think I'm getting in their business. Mm -hmm. And you're like, get in the business. Acknowledge that, hey, I know that I struggled as an adult child of doors. Maybe you don't, but I wanted you to hear this show. Anyway, so um, go ahead and show them this. Go to my website, breakfastwithbacon.com and see all of the fantastic guests that God has brought me, um, other people, Restored Ministry, also working um, with children mm -hmm. of divorce, healing them. We've had so much good. So like me on Facebook, Instagram, Rumble, YouTube, and of course, sign up for my newsletter on breakfastwithbacon.com. And that way you'll find out, you know, where I'm speaking or where my standards are doing whatever it is that they're doing. And also um, coming to Virginia Beach, October 28th, come to the Truth Speakers uh, Conference, Disrupting the Culture with Truth. We have Father Robert Altier. Are you familiar with him? Bethany? Am I? I uh, he maybe wrote maybe. a book. He's a priest. He wrote a book called God's Plan for Your Marriage. And he's really a good supporter of the work that you do. And of course, standards ministry and stuff. But we have him. We have Christine Watkins. We have Daniel O'Connor, Doug Barry, um, Alexis Walkenstein, and a Catholic comedian. So you can't be Catholic without laughing, right? <laughs> so come uh, register, go to truthspeakers.org to sign up for that conference, but get your ticket early. All right. I think I've done enough talking. I am Dr. Christine Bacon. You've been watching Breakfast with Bacon. And I'd like to remind you always to live your life. Remember? Sunny side up. Yes. <laughs>